She said, this is a personal story about me. This is what I experienced, and this is, you know, it, it's something that uh, everything that you hear about here happened to me or was experienced by me, so you need to understand a little bit about me. So yes, I've been in the Portland area my entire career, so I've been very lucky in the fact that I worked many different places. I've worked for startups, I've worked for major corporations, and currently work for Intel. I have a hobby, which is my Irish wolfhounds, and that's kind of easy to see here. I also do a lot of volunteer work, so I do work with the women who code Portland. I work with, I'm a Trevor Chat uh, crisis counselor, and I also do uh, board of directors on our fire district up in Vernonia, Oregon, where I used to be a fire dick, used to be a fireman. So anyway, the engineer in me likes to break this down into the problem statement, the data and, and information, and then on to what the possible solutions may be. So our problem is, is the intersection of diversity and inclusion and how it can affect privacy and anonymity. And why, what happens when we create those goals? We actually become blind to the people that we are going to be affecting. We tend to look at the goal as a number, we look at the goal as a point to get to, and yet we never stop to ask the question, at what cost? We tend to affect people that we have no idea. As we know, diversity and inclusion is a huge industry buzzword right now, and it's, you know, there's not a corporation around that doesn't, that you don't see a news article about, a blog post, a tweet, something about their diversity and inclusion program and the data that they've put out showing you how well they're doing. What is diversity? Well, I really don't need to talk, tell this crowd what diversity is because we already know that if you want to talk and look like everybody you work with, you're going to make your decisions based on those inherent biases. Well, one of the things we have to, that we really need to look at is we need that perspective. And without diversity, you can't get any perspective. So what's inclusivity, right? Once again, this is a crowd that I really don't need to talk to about this, but this is where you know, you've actually made a policy or a conscious decision to include people who may otherwise be excluded. Right? And this could be anybody. Right? This can be any underrepresented minority. This can be you know, sexually based, right, racially based. You, know, it's, you want these people to share their perspective with you. And without embracing diversity, not just accepting it, Without embracing diversity, you cannot have inclusivity. So now, privacy and anonymity. Now, as I said, since this is my personal story, the reason that I'm giving you these definitions is how I experience this and how I see this. So I wanted everyone to make sure that they see how I define these terms, because these are defined by people in different ways. So privacy being I have the right to give my information out to whoever I want at any point in time. But I also have the right to say, no, I don't want you to use my information anymore. Anonymity, much like my shadow, means that when you're looking at me or if I do something, I'm untraceable, untrackable, and not visible. This becomes very important when you're talking about DNI programs. Self-identification. This is, this is a big word that a lot of people have been throwing around lately. And it's the type of thing that if you don't realize, there's many, many underrepresented minorities that need to self-identify or you don't know that they're there and in, and in existence. And if they choose not to self-identify, you've ruined your DNI program. How do you get them to self-identify? you create a safe environment for them to where they feel comfortable sharing that information. If they don't feel comfortable sharing that information, you can't hold that against them. Once again, it's privacy and anonymity versus your goals. One 
of the things that uh, came up is Q Research did a study here, I think it was two years ago in 2015, and I didn't want to throw the graphs up because I didn't want this to be a, a technical type talk, so I, didn't, I took the graph out. But it's very important. They found that of people who, of LGBTQ people who would self-identify, that the ones from 18 to 36 were the most likely to self-identify. The ones from 37 to 71 were the least likely to identify, and when you look at my age group, we are by far the least likely to identify, to self-identify as LGBTQ, and we're talking about less than 50%. So if you say 50% of the people that work at Intel who are over 50 don't self-identify, right? So we now have a common set of definitions. We all know how I saw this, and so you can experience this in my context. So anyway, this became the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> because there are really good things <laughs> that occurred. <laughs> so I want you to know that I'm not bashing anybody here. Uh, this is purely my experience. There were many good things, and things continue to improve to this day. And a lot of what I experienced because I worked with HR, I worked with everybody, won't be experienced by the next people down the road. So the good things, they have world-class benefits. I, my employer, I mean, I feel so privileged to work for an employer who has embraced this, and I mean, they've given us some world-class benefits when it comes to trans healthcare. They have an employee code of conduct that is enforced, and when I say enforced, I mean they take it very seriously. They also have very nice inclusive amenities. They, we have all gender restrooms in every single building. But because of the way that they wrote their employee code of conduct, it's not required. You may use any restroom you want, and people cannot complain about it. If they have a complaint, they're to take it to HR. So, with all of these, Great stuff. But then we go move on. The bad things. When I first started looking into the trans health care benefits, because I was in the process of transitioning, and I tried to locate, they, they advertised it on the employee website. So I said, I oh great, let's go see how we use these. No information. All I could find was the little news blurb that they had put out to the entire world that we have these benefits. And yet, inside the company, we couldn't get any information. So, I said, okay, what do I have to do here? So I said, okay, I will finally, I will out myself. I am not out at work at this point in time, and I didn't feel comfortable being out. I'm, you know, my age, my history, my career, I was not ready for this. I decided, okay, one person is fine. I filed the HR ticket. 72 hours later, I got my response. I don't know anything about this. Here, let me forward this on to my boss. I wasn't asked if this information could be forwarded on. It was automatically forwarded, and this was the response that I got back. Okay. Well, it was about four or five days later that the second response came. The second response comes back saying, I don't know anything about this either, but when you do find out, please let me know because I would like to know about this. Well, finally, after I got through HR, my final response from HR was, sorry, you have to talk to your insurance company. So. You can see where this is going. 10 people, 60 days later, I finally had the answer to my question that was a very simple one. How do I use these benefits? So once again, DNI goals didn't look at the big picture and say, at what cost? Right? They were so busy getting this information out to the world, they didn't look at the people inside. Ugly. Less 
than a couple of months after I went through all of this and got through this, we decided that they were going to do an LGBTQ self-identification survey. In fairness, they were doing it for the right reasons. They wanted to see how best they could serve the LGBTQ community inside. They also wanted to see what the landscape was because, once again, if you don't self-identify, you're not visible. Right? So they were doing this for the right reasons. But you know you're in for a really wild ride when you open up the survey and the very first question is. Now, in all fairness, they actually did have somebody scheduled who was a trans person to go over all of the trans-related questions. She wasn't available, and through oversight, <laughs> they just didn't ask. But it wasn't just the trans-related questions that were a problem here. Remember now, we're talking about diversity and inclusion goals. This was a self-identification survey. The next one was these questions. Who do you know on your team? And they actually had numbers out there, zero to, four, zero to one, one to five, seven to 10. This is not self-identifying. This is saying, all of these people here, I'm outing whether they want to be or not. Okay. Once again, the DNI goals need to match. They need to be clarified. You need to understand who you are talking to and who you could possibly hurt on the other side. The irony is in their frequently asked questions under the uh, additional information was the Human Rights Council that when you clicked on the link it took you to this page. So our takeaways here. And, and this is something that everybody needs to really think about. This, this conversation needs to be started with, you know, every DNI team that exists. Clarify the goals up front. Ask the question, at what cost? Look at the teams and look at the people you're going to be affecting that you may not realize that you're affecting. Make sure you have a safe environment. Because if you don't have a safe and inclusive environment from the very get-go, they're not going to self-identify. They're going to find a reason not to. Transparency. Make all of the information available. If you're advertising this out to the world, make sure that the information is available, not just internally, because you're looking to try to attract a diverse and, and inclusive uh, workforce, Make sure that this information is available externally also. If you're advertising it, make sure everybody can find it. And last but not least, make sure that you ask the people you are affecting. Because I guarantee you they will have perspective that you will not have thought of. And it was last year, just about this time, that at AlterConf in DC, Emily Gorchansky said in her talk, I want to be safe, not strong. I thought about that for a little bit, and, and safe having the meaning of being free from harm or risk, um, you know, secure from threat or danger. I realized that the third meaning of safe that is in the dictionary really played out to me, and that is unlikely to produce controversy or contradiction. I wrote this originally as directed towards me, how I felt. And after I was here today, I changed the way that this was and tried to make it exactly what I've been saying. I want everybody's existence to be safe because we are not a contradiction and we should never be controversial. I have to give a shout out to my teammates, Tiberius Heflin, Constanza Heath, Carolyn Heath, because they're the ones that actually pushed me to change this from an internal blog post to an actual presentation. Kathleen Huggins, who's actually here today, she did all of my illustrations for me, and my teammate extraordinaire. And of course, me, because I like puppy pictures, pre-transition. <laughs> and I thank you. <laughs>